I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. I am so glad that we're finally recording this episode. Are you? Oh, it has been haunting me. I, I, I don't remember when I started researching this, but um, basically... I was having a bit of problems starting research this, this um, for this episode. Yeah. I went through four different creatures before I got to uh before I got to this episode. This this oh, topic. Man. Yeah. Um Cuz you, know, you were texting you you were texting me about rage and about document length the entire time. Yes. <laughs> well, Rage, because this is, like, a thing that, it turns out, I may have stumbled upon a cryptid that is actually, like, my, one of my triggers. Oh, man. Um, it turns out, and I wasn't aware that it was one of my triggers, because it's, like, literally the perfect creature to make John angry. Oh, man. Um... (laughs) (laughs) jeez all right well so i am loving it um (laughs) yeah i actually because i was so angry about this this particular cryptid i am doing a very different thing this week oh man staying on topic (laughs) <laughs> oh, no. What do you think this is? Do you think this is some kind of like actual podcast where they actually pay attention to their research and do everything perfectly? This isn't Skeptoid. No, this <laughs> This is super not. This is not Skeptoid. This is even Monster Talk. This is this is our we are I, I wanna couch everything that you're about to hear in the fact that we are in fact a comedy podcast. Yes. Yes. So ultimately, we're a comedy podcast, but but we do write like well, upwards we, of what is it this week? Seventeen pages and cite sources, uh, something like that. Yeah. My this week is eleven pages, but it also is a uh, twenty five hundred words. So nice. My yeah. cousin was over and um, mm-hmm. she was complaining. She said, "Oh, I I, I have a I have a, a historical." non-fiction class and we have to write 20 pages and in my head i was like oh come on i do that yeah you, know. <laughs> you practically do that once and that that's probably double space yeah yeah that's probably Two. double space oh what i wouldn't give yeah mine's not double spaced yeah no we never double space i mean you're putting pictures and stuff like that but at least i i've every, got like we beat that every like each every if you two episodes or something we we, we beat that yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a constant escalation, but because there's a lot of information, and I'm probably going to be angry for most of it. Yeah, let's, let's jump into this. Do you have a scream filter on your mic? Let me go get it. It's <laughs> it's literally three feet of uh, fuzz that just goes over the mic. <sighs> All right. Um. So welcome to Always Ropen. Ooh. It's the latest in the uh, the stable of anti-rooster teeth. Not anti-rooster teeth, but nega rooster teeth. <gasps> Always broken! It took me yeah, there you go. until just now. I was like, oh, man. Okay. Yeah. Right on. Yep, yep. We've got um, we've got all sorts of uh, cryptids and hosts. Um, it's a lot of screaming, so it's not that different from Always Open. <laughs> um, uh, I'm John Dunham. I'm Brandon Boyer. Yeah, so this week is a is a rough one for me. Yeah. So <laughs> it's hard for me to even do the try and guess what it is because I'm yeah. so mad about it. So 
It was. It first appeared. Yes. Depending on what blog post you read by this, the individual who discovered it. Oh. It either started in the 1920s. We're starting this way. 1930s. 20s or 30s, okay. Uh-huh. Uh huh. It might be a historical cryptid of the people of New Guinea. Which okay. is now Papua New Guinea, but at the time that it supposedly was discovered, it was New Guinea. Um, or it first was discovered in 2004. Still in New Guinea, or is that that um... still in New Guinea? Okay. Um, the taxonomy of the creature is pterosaur. I like it. So, what do you think this is? Uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm not even gonna go through the whole, like, here's what happened in New Guinea. It's pterodactyl. Right, 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 right. Well, right. no, it it's the roping, in particular. The roping, which is I'm the, the joke. So I, I get it. Oh, always roping. I yeah, get yeah. it. I, I was lazy. I'm pretty excited about this. The roping um, is uh, again the uh, Scholastic Book Fair. It had a book and it had the roping in it, and it read all about that. Like, like I'm just excited for this one. Yeah, I'm going to kill your dreams. And hopefully I kill everyone's dreams in regard to the rope. Uh, I'm not going to tell you about the rope at first. I'm going to do things a little bit differently this week, because this is the reason why this episode has me so mad. October 8th, 1882. Westwood, Kent. It's a okay. location in England. We've got a badass granny right here. We do, actually. This woman is amazing. There, uh, <clears throat> I'm looking at a picture. It's black and white. And she's got I th- like a she's got like a, a, a jungle hiking mm-hmm. outfit going on. She's got a um, what is that a uh, insect catching net? Mm-hmm. She's got a, a satchel. It's yeah. uh, she's pretty bad. It's like she's got a cool she's stance. An, she's an awesome human being. Yeah. So the woman that Brandon just described, her name is Lucy Evelyn Cheeseman. She was born as <laughs> one of five children to Florence Maud Castle and Robert Cheeseman. Uh huh. <laughs> What's that? What's, what are you laughing at? The name? No. Cheeseman? Yeah, no. You're laughing at the name. I know you. I could I think of. You. I mean, I would change my name to something Cheddar if I was him. In her early years, she acted as a governess to the Murray Smith family, which was found in a. Um, so there's a thing that in England they do yeah. where they, they basically collate all of the. Uh, the british and irish botanists so it's gotcha. called the dictionary of british and irish botanists and horticulturalists including plant collectors flower painters and garden designers that's the, a interesting title i'd like to say she seems like a pretty good up person you're gonna make puns about her name the whole time aren't you yeah okay um which is like a little dictionary entry the thing that i was talking about before you so rudely interrupted me with uh-huh. a good up pun yeah uh it's a little snippet that basically talks about, you know, oh, this is this person, this is what they did, yada, yada, yada. Okay. That's how we know that she was governess. Um, she was actually fluent in French and German Ooh. prior to World War I. Okay. Yeah, she, she traveled in those countries, and ultimately, because of the way that, you know, education worked at the time, she couldn't yeah. become, like, a... Uh, she was very interested in, like, you know... Veterinary, the veterinary field and veterinary sciences, but because of the way that things worked, yeah, she couldn't get a degree and go to college for that. Okay. Um, but World War One broke out. Oh, okay. She worked as a civil servant to the Admiralty. Uh huh. Um, and she used her skills, uh, like her her multilingualism, yeah, to the advantage of the Admiralty. Oh, that's pretty um, dope. No, she's she's an awesome person. Yeah. Uh, after the war, she met with. Harold Maxwell Lefroy, which Lefroy, Lefroy, I don't know. He was a professor of entomology um, at the Imperial College of Science. And because she had an interest in the natural world, Uh uh, she parlayed her relationship with this individual into becoming the assistant curator of insects at the London Zoo in May 1917. Oh, dope. Yeah. Uh, Eventually, she became the curator in 1920, which you should know, is means she was the first person to be a curator at the London Zoo. The first person? The first, well, first woman to be oh, okay. a curator at the London Zoo. Sorry. Damn, right The on. first woman to be yeah. a curator at the London Zoo. 
this woman is amazing. She's pretty dope. She's kind of a hero. Nothing's going to keep um, her down, man. She'll never be feeling blue. You're, you're, you don't even know the half of it. <laughs> her story gets wild. Yeah. I probably just, I probably, uh, I probably just missed a joke. Did you? I, I, I don't know. I'm really, I, I know what's going to come. So I'm like really upset. Uh huh. And I'm trying to, to fight through my anger. Yeah. Um, so in 1924, after becoming the curator of the London Zoo. Okay. Uh, she was, invited to join the St. George Zoological Exposition to the Marquesas and Galapagos Islands. Gotcha. Um, she was going to be the official entomologist. Oh, cool. The, the party. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, at the time, you bring along an entomologist because, honestly, most of the things you're going to discover are bugs. Yeah. Let's be real. Uh, she left the expedition in Tahiti, though. What'd she why? do that for? Oh, yeah, why? why? Because it was so disorganized. Oh, I like it. She doesn't take shit, man. She said, you guys can't get your act together. I'm gone. I'm out, Ski. I'm going to be yeah. over here inventing Brie. Yeah. God. Man, you cannot let up on the cheese puns. It's literally in her name, John. Oh, blue. Got it. I got it. <laughs> oh, that was a slow burn. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that, well, that one's tricky because it's it's a vi- that's actually good wordplay as opposed to the Belize thing. Yeah, she. You know what happened? She said you can all see go fuck yourselves and left. Yes, that's what she said. So, anyways, after leaving, it was she such actually, a good joke. John. It was a very good joke. It was, it was such a, a very good, good joke. joke. Okay, I can't respond to that though. I can't. There's nothing I can do. Once you make a joke like that, it's over. Uh-huh. You, you've successfully nuked the the pun trade. Uh huh. I hope. <laughs> After she left the expedition, she continued to explore and collect specimens on her own. Basically, she's a badass. Yeah. From the scientific perspective, like I think she actually discovered new creatures on that expedition too. Yeah. Like insects, um, and and plant life because she collected both. Um, yeah. And she did that on like a hundred dollars. Uh huh. Like total. What's a hundred dollars so. in nineteen twenty money? Hang on, Alexa. What's a hundred dollars in nineteen twenty money? A lot. She's not sure about that. It, it's enough. Um. It's a uh, hundred dollars nineteen twenty equivalent. Uh, that one thousand two hundred dollars. That's still a lot. That's still no, actually that's, that's still, still a little. not a lot. That, that's, not that's a lot still at all. not a lot. To go yeah. out on your own expedition. Come on. Yeah, that's still pretty good. Yeah. Um, in 1926, she resigned her from her position as insect curator and affiliated with the British Museum in an unpaid position, um, and then spent the majority of her next 12 years yeah exploring the islands in the Pacific Ocean, namely in the one that's going to be the focus of this episode, New Guinea. Oh yeah. Which at the time was not Papua New Guinea. She's a badass lady. She is, to the point that she was extremely well-respected by the indigenous population. Is uh, there, she... like, a TV show or anything where they talk about her? Because I feel like at this point in time, like, she like she went to school, became a curator, went on, on a – went led expeditions. I don't know if led, but she was on expeditions. She said, you know, screw you guys. You're not good enough. Went off and did her own expeditions – traveled to new guinea and then she's doing her own thing this is she's pretty awesome oh oh yeah Yeah. no like it's wild yeah um she's a crazy cool person she had extreme respect for all the people she encountered Uh uh-huh um and let me point this out because she was a woman in 1920 she wasn't allowed to get a formal education yeah so it's not that she wouldn't have thrived in a formal education. It's literally she wasn't allowed. Yeah. And she's still, like, legitimately thr- thriving, scientifically speaking. Yeah. Um, like, it, 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 she's amazing. She's a badass woman in history, man. Oh, yeah. No, totally. Um, so, getting back to the indigenous population in New Guinea, though, she was known to them as the woman who walks. That's or, cool. 
the Lady of the Mountain. She's got cool nicknames. Oh, yeah. Amazing nicknames. I wish I had a nickname half as cool as that. Yeah. Um, but it's no, no surprise. It shouldn't come as a surprise that this respect was earned, though. Because mm-hmm. she treated the native populations with respect. She didn't try to, like, convert them or change their views or anything yeah. like that. She respected them as uh, a culture. And not only that, she recorded anthropological details about these indigenous tribes that yeah. were actually in the process of disappearing due to Western exposure. Yeah, so, we do that, man. Yeah, so she's like the only reason we have written records of some of their practices and behaviors is because in, like, she was their there. culture is because yeah. she was there and she recorded details of that. Right on. Like she is like even nowadays people are bad at that yeah like that one guy who got shot up by arrows because he's a moron yeah yeah (laughs) um total idiot yeah that's also illegal like he should have done that super illegal for any reason at all he should have never done that but also it was super illegal he Um, also could have committed genocide well, yeah, that's why it was illegal. Is one yeah. they shoot everybody, but that's not why it was illegal. It was illegal because someone did it once, and like they wiped out a ton of people with the cult. Yeah, uh, if yeah. you don't know what we're talking about, there was uh, some missionary. I forget his name. I don't really care because I don't want to elevate his name. Yeah, you don't have to say um, his name. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't care. Uh, he was trying to uh, bring Christianity to some organiz- some some island nation. In the Indian Sea, not an island nation, but like a tribe. It yeah. literally was like fifty. And I think there's like fifty individuals in the tribe. Um, but they're the most isolated tribe in the world, pretty much. And they know about people. Well, not people. Wow. They know about Western people and they know about Westernization and all that stuff. But they're like, nah, nah, we're fine. Yeah. We don't need that. And I agree, they don't need. That. And this guy was like, well, I'm going to spread Christianity to them. Um, the problem is, because they have been isolated on that island for so long, uh, it, if the population gets a sickness, it's going to spread like wildfire and wipe out the population. So, as a result, the Indian government says, no, you're not allowed on this island. People aren't allowed on this island uh, because it's a literal... Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It could be a disaster. Yeah. That's basically it. So, um, anywho, enough about him. Let's get back to the, uh if, if you found it interesting, though, there's an episode of The Dollop, uh, I think. Was oh, it the dollop? yeah. It was, there was an episode of The Dollop about the, the island with... Uh, it has the one road around it, if I'm remembering correctly, and it was destroyed by Australia. Is that, I think they also had an episode on specifically this guy. Did they have an episode? No, yeah. there was a there was a side story about it. Oh, was there side stories about it? What, yes. Did they talk about like the place that trained them and all that? Yes, that was side stories. Oh, there's a side stories. Okay, never mind. Yeah, yeah. Side stories is the uh, last podcast on the left side story podcast where, um, thankfully not shot, Bigfoot, Ben Kissel, and uh, Henry Zabrowski uh, talk about things together, yeah. along with the guest appearance. Yeah, we're 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 bad. We advertise. For people free. <laughs> We're but really we like commercial them. for every other podcast. We really are. I mean, honestly, I, I, I feel like we've hit this point yeah. where we just talk about other podcasts, mainly because both of us are, I'd argue our main form of entertainment might be podcasts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's not unreasonable. Um, but anywho, so she also discovered a number of species Um during her time on the islands, uh, a lot of insects. Okay. Um, if you look at her Wikipedia page, and obviously you can look at the links, like, you know, that site where these are actually named, she has uh, no less than five amphibians and reptiles just from New Guinea alone. Okay. Uh, mostly frogs, but that's not entirely unheard of. Uh, eventually, because of how many discoveries she made, and how much work she produced for the scientific community. 
yeah. she would be given the Order of the British Empire, which is like a really high regarded thing, and earn herself a pension. No like shit. A civil servant pre- pension. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. So when World War II breaks out, she returns to England to help with the war effort. Yeah. However, she injured her back during the blackout. How'd she do that? Uh, getting off a train. So she just like must have slipped or something. Because keep in mind, at this point, she was born in 80, uh, 1882. Yeah. She's, at the time of the war, entering her 60s, somewhere around there. So I was I was talking about her breaking, uh, injuring her back, and Brandon posts a list of cheeses from Wikipedia in the, the Google Doc. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Anywho, um, her back injury resulted in her retirement from active exp- explorations expeditions. Well, for four years. Okay. 1954, yeah. at age 73, yeah. after getting her hip replaced, uh-huh. she spent nine months collecting 10,000 insects and 500 plants on an expedition to no shit. Anatium. Damn, we got the indestructible lady. Oh, yeah, no. Um, When she received her Order of the British Empire, she yeah. was quoted as saying, we drop down or get run over, but we never retire. No shit. Okay. I yeah. mean, maybe she inspired uh, that. Is it All Star? By Smash Mouth? Uh, you get knocked down, but you get up again. Is that? No, is that Chumbawamba? Oh, that's Chumbawamba. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, you just you just quoted Chumbawamba on that one. Okay, yeah. So she inspired Chumbawamba. So she's an honorary member of Chum- Chumbawamba. Yeah. Okay. Oh, let's let's just add that to her list of achievements then. I'll go edit her wiki. Uh, please don't, because I'm about to get into why that is a bad thing. So, okay. Um, she worked as an entomologist until until her death, April fifteenth, nineteen sixty nine. It would be weird if she continued afterwards. She might have. We don't know. Entomologists are cool. Yeah. They do some actually legitimately important individuals. Yeah. Because they're usually on the front line when it comes to diseases and things like that. Uh Uh-huh. Because the number one vector for disease is, generally speaking, bugs. Yeah, and that's why we need to watch uh, Coyote Peterson get stung by the most painful insects on the world in Brave Wilderness. You're just contributing to his delinquency. It is. He's a sexual deviant. He needs to get stung by them insects. He is. And just don't make eye contact, okay? <laughs> just don't because make eye contact. Don't make eye contact with Coyote Peterson if you ever meet him. It's dangerous. It's... Just back away slowly. Obviously, we're joking. He's an amazing individual. And in my opinion, he's kind of the next Steve Irwin. Like, he fills that role. Yeah. No, he's pretty dope. Um, Which... He, he is actually a pretty legitimately awesome person in terms of uh, improving literacy in regards to uh, the natural world. But, so this is nothing, none of what I just said has anything to do with the rope. Yeah, really. what do insects and uh, pterosaurs have in common? So, New Guinea, 1920 to 1930. Okay. Um, I really wanted to give a bio on... Her life first. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Because what I'm about to talk about is something that a certain individual has really focused in on. Yeah. And he's kind of ignored the other portions of her life in favor of an agenda. Okay. But I wanted to take the time to really highlight her life because she is a legitimately amazing individual in history. Um, who I had never heard of before I'd started doing this research. Uh, and her work alone has had a undoubtedly positive influence on the world of science. Um, but one night during her stay in New Guinea, she had an encounter with some strains of lights. And I'm going to read a direct quote. Now, this quote came from a website that supports the existence of the rope. I could not find the original copy of the book, 
which was uh, Two Roads of pa Papua. Um, because it hasn't been digitized, and it's still technically under copyright because of copyright being screwed Oh, up. it's not old enough. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mickey. Yeah. yeah. So this is this is from the book, and keeping in mind, this is a direct. This is from a site that is pro Roadman. Yep. While at Mondo, I witnessed a most curious phenomenon, which I could not understand, nor could I later hit upon any satisfactory explanation for it. It was a very close, still evening. Thundery conditions, yet no storms. It was moreover clear. There were no cotton wool clouds roving round, which is a rather rare occurrence. I spent much time in leaning over the veranda and gazing across the flat monotone of the jumbled hills against the purple sky, when suddenly I saw a flash of light somewhere below the horizon. It was a rather slow flash, and it might have been made with an electric torch by someone with a finger on the switch to prolong it perhaps four seconds. In a moment, it came again, and this time I counted. Yes, about four or five seconds. But that flash had been a little distance away from the first. Flashes continued at intervals. By no possibility could there be human beings out there using flash lamps at intervals. I measured the pos my position carefully against the veranda posts and also the spots where they appeared, so that in the morning I should have some idea about how far off they were. By daylight, I took up precisely the same position on the veranda and measured off against the posts where I had seen the lights the evening before. The flashes have been following a certain ridge of hills. Three ridges are visible, one above the other in that direction. The highest one on the horizon. It was in, on the middle one that this phenomena appeared. And it seems as, the, as if the flashes had kept closer to the top of that one ridge. About one week later, precisely the same thing occurred. It may be dismissed at once that the flashes were due to any human agency. Even if they had strong flashlights in their possession... There could be no incentive for Bushmen to stand at intervals, and I reckoned that there would have been nearly 30 individuals for two or three miles along a ridge, flashing them where they could not be seen, where they could not see one another. I uh, like it. And like, yeah. So, like, she, nothing she in went her... out, she, so she saw him, I, I just like she went and investigated. She, just, she didn't just see a weird thing and go, hey, I saw a weird thing, that's proof that there's yeah. weird stuff. She went out there checked it out and uh yeah. it seems like she came up with a solid estimate of what it would have taken to replicate uh yeah. what she saw so when i read that i think okay maybe there's some conditions that cause like ball lightning or something along those yeah. lines to occur and it just happens regularly or something along those lines maybe there's a precise set of geological conditions that result in this happening yeah right that was that was basically what i was thinking um ultimately the key is evelyn was a scientist about yeah. She led the story with a disclaimer. She offered no explanation for the event. However, she reported the data uh -huh. and said, I could not arrive at a conclusion for these data points. However, for the sake of anecdotes, I'm going to record this. Yeah. It's still anecdotal evidence because ultimately it is her story. However, if someone were to go there and perform more precise measurements, perform more precise estimations of what had happened, Maybe there might be something that can be done. It's basically the first step in science. Yeah. What she's just describing. Now, there are some less scrupulous individuals who have labeled this as the first sighting of what's known as the Ropen Lights. So, like, uh, okay. Pterosaurs, I get it. I know what they are. They don't have lights on them. They're not like an airplane how – she's describing a singular light. I don't get how you get a – how do you get to a light – where does the light come from? How do you assign a light to a pterosaur? Well – that I did, that, that, There's a disconnect there. Well, I'll get to that, but I think I hear a message coming in. Oh, man. What is it about this time? I, I, I'm – not really sure. It's you know it's from oh. the yeah. It might be because I haven't talked about a cryptid for a solid thirty minutes. Oh, that yeah. might be it. Oh, I think it takes a while for the signal to get stronger, but I think they're saying Rhinox, Rhinox number one. No, it's coming in stronger. Rhinox number one. Rhinox number one. Correct. Incorrect. That's... <laughs> Incorrect. <laughs> Is 
Today's sponsor is Occam's Razors. Other razors out there assume that more blades is better. Our founder William believes that all you need are fewer high quality blades through which you may cut through the stubble of bullshit. Don't take my word for it. Use offer code Cryptopedia, that's capital C, lowercase r, lowercase y, capital P, capital T, the number zero, lowercase p, the number three, lowercase d, the number one, capital A, at checkout to save 15% off of the Occam's Razor subscription plan and see for yourself. Now back to the show. Man, this, this has got, I'm like, so drained by what I'm about to have to talk about. Are you? I'm excited. Yeah. So let's just dive into that it. That was let's, the let's... first three pages. Yes. So you've got that was three pages. <laughs> the remaining <laughs> the entire rest. So the whole rest of it is all the stuff you're you you're this upset is about. The the rest of it, so uh that was about what? three tenths of the the thing yeah. so the remaining seven tenths of this document are the thing that has made me mad yeah so we're gonna we're in buckle in we're in for a ride so the ropin translates to demon flyer in the local language supposedly i don't know if i believe that but that's what they say uh, it's described by proponents as a type of pterosaur, not a dinosaur. Keep in mind, dinosaurs mm -hmm. and pterosaurs are not the same thing. There are no current living relatives of a pterosaur alive today. That is a fact. There's no... Is it? Yes. Is actually. it? I mean, there's the roping. I hate you. <laughs> I hate you so much. Um, so I found a video by an individual named Trey the Explainer. Oh, no. No, Trey the Explainer, I'm cool with this dude. All right? Um, I'm mainly citing him because, honestly, I didn't feel like digging through any more of the site's pro roping to yeah. figure this out. So, basically, it's a combination. It's more or less a chimera of pterosaur traits. Okay. Um, it's got the crest of a pterodon uh -huh. and the size of a pterodon, for that matter. Okay. Um, it has the tail of... Uh, Ram for four and die. Ram Go for Heinekaide. Ram for Ram for Ram for. We're, call, we're calling it Ram for. It has a tail. It's got a diamond shaped tail. Okay, <laughs> so it's a tail, a long tail that ends in a diamond. Uh huh. And it's been described as looking like swordettes, which is a type of pterosaur. Yeah, it's a small pterosaur. You did a, um, a, a good job describing the, the pronouncing the tail. By the way. Sordes? No, 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 no. The uh, ram, f ram f for high. Ki yeah, the ram for high kai dai. Yeah, it's yeah. I. Anywho, I so. <laughs> here's the thing that's most frustrating to this about me. When yeah. I was really little, I wanted to be a paleontologist. Like, yeah. Really bad. I have no less than seven copies of the original Megazord in different forms and incarnations. Uh huh. I love dinosaurs. I have like five near complete. I basically have five complete sets of the dinos, Dinobots. I love dinosaurs. I love pterosaurs. I love everything from the prehistoric era. Uh huh. There's a lot about this that I don't love. <laughs> so it has a wingspan of seven meters, okay. which, if you do basic math, that's uh, about 21 feet. Okay. Um, it has a tail that's seven meters long, so. Basically, we're talking about like a 23 foot long, 22, 24 foot long uh, creature. Yeah. Which, as I said before, it ends in a diamond, diamond tip, which is not an unheard of thing mm -hmm. in fossil designs. Um, and once again, well, not once again, but uh, the it really doesn't have existing legs. They're kind of a part of the wing structure, uh -huh. uh, which you can see in the image that we have on the on the uh the pdf that we're releasing to the patreon um you can if you search if you search uh rope in, you'll find a picture of it yeah pretty much um however its skin does not match the modern description or the modern the modern model 
of pterosaurs. Okay. So in the modern model, pterosaurs have uh, like these almost fur. Gotcha. It, it's yeah. there's the I'll go into it in a little bit because like I do have proto a section. Feathers. They're, yeah, they're basically proto feathers. No, not actually, they're not proto feathers. No. Okay. They're like a form of fur. But we'll, gotcha. I, I actually have a section where I talk about that a little bit more later. Bad. Um, so I don't want to actually, I don't want to mispronounce the thing. Okay. Um, it's actually more reptilian looking. Like it has like the mm -hmm. scaly skin and all that stuff that is kind of more similar to the pterosaurs from uh, Jurassic Park. So yeah. like your 90s, early 2000s, 80s, pre then uh, model which we've discovered is not an accurate modeling of what the fossils tell us. Yeah. Um, it also features a prominent crest, as I described before, which is kind of similar to pterodon. Um, and according to the cryptid wiki, the ropin is any featherless creature that flies in the southwest Pacific. That's an awfully broad description. Yep. And has a tail length more than 25% of its wingspan. Okay. That's that's the cryptid wiki description. Yeah. Yeah. So, the most noteworthy <laughs> feature of the Ropen... Yeah. ...is that it has bioluminescence. Oh, I would call that noteworthy. I that, That's not wrong. If there was a bioluminescent anything airborne, yeah, that, that'd be noteworthy. Yeah, if there was a bioluminescent anything with a vertebrae, that would be noteworthy. Yeah. That would be very noteworthy. <laughs> it sure would. Anything it with would a vertebrae be. that is terrestrial. Yeah. Because there are vertebrae that do not are non terrestrial that have bioluminescence, but uh -huh. all terrestrial vertebrae, not a single one has uh bioluminescence. That's weird. That is pretty weird, huh? Anywho. Well whatever. Um so according to the proponents of the Ropin, okay. this is supposedly used to attract fish. Okay. To the surface for hunting. Funny that that doesn't exist for any other bioluminescent creatures. Yeah. Hmm. Anywho, it, it's almost as though, um, evolutionarily speaking, that's a that's a logical, and bioluminescence would be a problem for other predators. But who knows? Yeah. Uh. Anywho. So this bioluminescence feature of it is used uh -huh. by proponents to tie the story that I told about uh, oh, Evelyn Cheeseman to yeah. the Ropen. They're saying that this is the first sighting of the Ropen lights by a Western. Okay. Um, there's other, there, there's actually one other thing that's very important about the Ropen. Yes. Uh, and that's that it's a grave robber. It's oh, scavenger. fantastic! Mm-hmm. Yes. Where does so that come suppose, from? Why would... Uh, so, I have a video. Okay. That I'm going to... Well, I can just... Boop, click. Yeah, just click that that video. So, um, this is by... This is a video by Jonathan Wintel. Yeah. And it's a... Uh, it's basically a interview with a indigenous man by, I think, the name of Gideon. Uh... Uh -huh. Oh, Michael, Michael. Sorry, sorry. Gideon's another one. Another person. Um, in which he describes a... Basically, they had recently buried someone. And the roping came in 1949, supposedly. Dug up the man. Uh -huh. And carried his body away. To be eaten in the mountains. Huh. Mm-hmm. Is um, there... I can't think... So there are... Like... There's scavengers, but I don't know if there's creatures that like dig up. Like, like I, something. There might be. There, there might, might be. be. I didn't. I didn't look into that too much. But uh, I well, should actually, know. No, that's why there are graves in the first place because you have to yeah. go a certain yeah. depth, otherwise they will get dug up. They will get dug up. So, um, it should be noted though that uh, if the creature is a scavenger and a if it's if it's going after human graves, that means it does it more than more often than not. Yeah. And that might indicate that it has a major food source in humans. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because when you think about it, that's a very large source of energy. Uh huh. 
that brings us to the person who I have. One of the people who, in this world, I have the least amount of respect for. Oh, man. There's a lot of people I don't like. Yeah. But this individual, there's no lost love from me. If I got into a fight with him, I would be happy. I mean, flaming Hot Cheetos aren't that bad. You don't have to be... Just because they, just because he made them. Jonathan Whitcomb. Okay. The person who uploaded that video that uh-huh. I just referenced. Um, Jonathan Whitcomb is a young Earth creationist. Oh, here we go. He's from Southern California. It's going to get good. And he's a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints or the Mormons. Oh, he's got like a little trifecta of awesome. His account is literally the first instance in which I can find the term rope. No shit. It originates from him in his 2004 book, yeah. Searching for Ropins, Living oh. Pterosaurs in Papua New Guinea. Now, that's not the only book on Ropins he's written. No. He wrote a follow-up to this yeah. book. Um, and it is called Searching for Ropins and Finding God. Oh, exciting. Okay. So... I think you know where this story is about to, the, the turn this story is about to take. Yeah, man. This is going to get good. Uh, good is a word for it. Not a word I'd use, but good is a word for it. So he traveled to Papua New Guinea in 2004 to find a living pterosaur. <laughs> it was originally reported. So he's if he's the first time that shows up, mm-hmm. why is he... <laughs> Why is he spending money going there if he's the guy that did it? Like, if if, if there's no other source, where the, like, prior... Like, if the word Ropin doesn't show up anywhere before his book, why is he going there to bother finding it? I have no idea. Well, actually, I do, but we'll get like, into it. Like, is there, like, New Guinea... Is so, there any folklore in the area that would lead someone to believe there's something like that in the area? Well, so, there was originally a pterosaur that was reported by missionaries Paul Nation and Carl Baugh in 1994. Okay. Um, They interviewed a bunch of people about something that they saw, uh, and there's some pictures that exist online of this and all that stuff. Okay. And these interviews incurred on the island of Amboy, which is nearby to the mainland of Papua New Guinea, what is now Papua New Guinea. Gotcha. Um. He has a documentary that he released. It's a small documentary. Yeah. And I say documentary in quotes. In which he um, performs a number of interviews. <laughs> One of which is with a man named Gideon. Uh-huh. Now, to call this interview anything besides leading uh, is a gross understatement of interviews in general. <laughs> uh he asked questions like, did it have a tail? So, the tail was as long as the wings. So, if you've ever seen the Netflix documentary American Vandal, yeah. in season two, they have a big old section about leading witnesses and false confessions. Yeah. The two questions I just read off are literally the definition of leading questions. Yeah. Instead of saying, tell me your story of that day. When uh-huh. you, like, you know, hey, have you ever seen this creature uh, called the Ba? Or whatever. Yeah. Tell me the story about the time you saw him. Ultimately, the interviews are unconvincing. <laughs> and to me, uh, amateurish at best. Yeah. Even if the interviews were not conducted in an extremely poor manner, mm-hmm. an interview is still anecdotal evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anecdotal evidence to me is just story. Yeah. Just because you have a story that someone tells you doesn't mean it's proof. Cheeseman, before, literally didn't say that her her story was anything, any kind of proof. Mm -hmm. And she knew that because she had type specimens for a number of things. One of the flowers that she discovered, it's suspected that it's extinct now. And she was the person to find literally the last one, and she yeah. discovered it. 
that's called finding a type specimen. That is proof of an existence of a thing. Yeah. I saw a monster above the lake is not proof of existence. So the video, uh, it, it visits a number of people. It revisits yeah. Michael, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh-huh. In the in the show notes, I have a link um, to the section where he interviews uh, Gideon. Mm-hmm. But uh, the way that it's it's conducted is really bad. His camera work is bad. He didn't bring a tripod, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> uh, this is also where I found evidence of him talking about the scavenger behaviors of the creature. Like they hung yeah. tuna in the trees to try to attract tuna. Them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which I don't know what the popular. I don't know anything about the animals in Papua New Guinea, so I'm not going to talk too much Tuna's about it. Tuna's a big fish. Tuna's a big fish. Um, this is where he states that about like this is where the notion of the grave robber and scavenger stuff comes in as well. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Whitcomb ascribes to the theory that the Ropin is the fiery spirit in the Book of Isaiah, chapter thirty, verse six. Oh, I see what he's doing now. Uh, yep. I gotcha. Okay. So I'm gonna quote the King James version. Yeah. Which is probably where this came from. Okay. The burden, yep. So, the burden of the beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and old lion, the viper in flying, the viper in fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. So, Brandon. Do you know anything about the King James Version of the Bible? <laughs> that I do. It would appear that Mr. James had the Bible rewritten for him because of reasons. He was, uh, the church didn't necessarily like him or his lifestyle, so he changed the Bible. <laughs> you might be correct about that. Yeah. Uh, it also tends to go for more flowery verse. Yeah. Uh, more flowery pose, a little more poetic, uh-huh. um, and it's a lot more brimstony, like fire yeah. and brimstone, like uh, fiery flying serpent. Yeah, which uh, is what you know. Whitcomb is assuming is a good description of a bioluminescent, meaning fiery. Yeah, fl- uh, ter- a pterodon of some kind, uh-huh. flying, and serpent because hey, it's a reptile, right? Yeah. Um. So, if we look at a more modern translation, which I'm using the New Living Translation, so I went to, like, a Bible website and took yeah. verses. So, this is a little bit more uh, accurate to what the original Hebrew said, because yeah. Isaiah was a part of the, uh, the, I think it's a part of the Torah, but, yeah. anywho. Um, it's in the Old Testament, for sure. This message came to me concerning the animals of Negveh. The caravan moves slowly across the terrible desert to Egypt. Donkeys weighed down with riches and camels loaded with treasure. All to pay for Egypt's rejection. They travel through the wilderness, a place of lions and lionesses. A place where vipers and poisonous snakes live. All this, and Egypt will get you nothing in return. Ah, that seems more straightforward, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Because actually, in the original Hebrew... Flying is a mi- flying is a mistranslation of the original thing, which is basically, uh, if I remember correctly, it's something along the lines of like hi- how birds hide themselves in their yeah. wings. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a mistranslation of that. Uh, it's supposed to mean like poisonous or something along those lines. Yeah. And the fiery is literally referring to the fiery sensation of poison when mm-hmm. it bites you. Gotcha. So, uh, I'm not a biblical scholar. But using this as evidence in a data point for, hey, look at this. Yeah. Not great. <laughs> not great. No. But there might be video evidence of this creature. May there be now. May there be. There may. So <laughs> uh, there's a popular YouTube video called Ropen, parentheses, front flying dinosaur. It's on Case in Point 51's YouTube channel. It was uploaded in 2008 for this one. 
It has 70 likes and 74 dislikes. The video is 18 <laughs> seconds long, and basically it's of the uh, the person's on the shore on yeah. an island in presumably New Guinea, but there's no uh, proof of that. If you look at it, yeah, it's it's definitely a uh, a flying creature. However, if you view this video, which will be in the show notes, uh, and then promptly Google frigate bird, and then look at the video while looking at the picture of the frigate bird, uh, uh, it's very clearly a frigate bird. Yeah. Um. So, was this the other thing in two thousand eight? It looks like I think it's got to be a re-upload or something cuz it's yeah. it's the quality is not up and up on it. it. It might be a re-upload. I couldn't find the original source. But it's a frigate bird looking at it side by side. Oh yeah, it has the traditional it has the wing swoop and all that stuff. Um a key thing though that I want to point out and this actually comes up in uh UFO sightings as well. Yeah. It's extremely difficult to gauge the size of something without a tree or something as a reference point. If oh, you're yeah. looking into a sky at something, it's very difficult to tell what size it is and how far away it is. Yeah. Because that's not how the human eye works. Oh, yeah. Well, the, with, with nothing else to a reference, if you're looking at something uh, like straight up in the sky, it could be 30 feet away or three miles away. You, you don't have a way, you know. Exactly. No way to judge your distance. I mean, look yeah. at a plane, right? They're all toy size because I can hold them. They're like micro machines because I can hold them in between my fingers, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, clearly. And they're all, like, if I just really wanted to, I could totally reach a plane. I know that. Yeah, totally. Because I know that. Because facts don't matter. <laughs> facts don't matter. So, because I'm a masochist. Yes. Oh, God. I uh, read through some of Jonathan Whitcomb's blogs. Yeah. I hate it. I hate it so much. The way that it's all formatted is terrible. However, I found a link on his work website. Okay. So he's a – basically he does video for attorneys and, like, he does – you know, he records things and stuff like all those yeah. lines. Um, I came across a collection of pictures from 1994. He's it an attorney? Well, no, he's not an attorney. Okay. He does, like, video work for attorneys. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I don't know the exact nature of it, but it's on laattorneyvideo.com slash nonlegal slash pterosaurs. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a bunch of pictures from the 1994 mission trip. Um. The, the the quote on the site is, Many natives living on the tropical island of Amboy, Saisi, Papua New Guinea, have seen the flying light, the bioluminescent glow of the rope in. Compare their experiences with others in PNG. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. So, um, a lot of the people from the, the documentary from before make an appearance in this on this website, like uh -huh. all of them. Literally all of them are on this website. Um, so it, it, it documents some of the individ individuals who had seen the roping. Yeah. And gives brief blurbs. There was one that stood out to me, though. Uh-huh. It's the uh, – if you look at the website, there's a 3x3 three three grid of pictures. Yeah. It's the bottom middle one. The interpreter uh, showed Jim Bloom – okay, yeah. The interpreter showed Jim Bloom – shows the picture in a magazine to the native islander pterosaur aka pterodactyl so he's showing them pictures and then mm -hmm. asking them to describe the picture pretty much well he's asking them to describe the rope end. so to the left of it there's another one another islander when shown a magazine illustration of a pterosaur told the interpreter that he himself had seen the flying creatures like that they eat fish and live in caves uh, i gotcha um I know I'm a skeptic, and that's an understatement, but this is a lot like leading a witness. It's, yeah, I would say it's a lot like that. Yeah. Um, the images and descriptions begin to paint a pretty awful picture in my mind. Yeah. So, 
what this smells like is manipulation of a local populace Uh uh-huh and an abuse of power yeah because the missionaries have an agenda they and john whitcomb as he stated basically want living pterosaurs to exist to disprove the notion of evolution yeah that is their his expressly stated purpose because he believes that if pterosaurs exist today Mm -hmm. because science says that they don't and says that it was billions of years ago pterosaurs exist now qed everything's solved however yes even if a pterosaur exists today Mm -hmm. that would not be proof that evolution doesn't exist no, it would just In be fact, proof that pterosaurs exist. It would be proof that pterosaurs exist. In fact, if the Ropen existed, because it resembles no known species of pterosaur, and doesn't, and there haven't been... Ah, I gotcha! It would actually be more evidence of evolution than not. Yeah! Um, but it should be noted that since the mass extinction event, there have been no pterosaurs found in the fossil record. So it doesn't matter because statistically speaking, and given the sheer number of fossils that we've gathered, there's Mm -hmm. almost no chance that pterosaurs existed past the mass extinction event. Yeah. Actually I think, um, I don't know how fast I could find it. I th- I think we're actually in the middle of a, a like currently in a um uh another mass extinction event. We are. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> yeah, it we we've recently officially lost the blue macaw, macaw which is the um uh the bird from yeah. Rio. Yeah, it's not great. Well, yeah, it's it's pretty bad. It's pretty we're bad. We're losing lots of shit real fast, man. Yeah, it's not great. Not not a fan personally, but yeah. you know. Um, no, no, I'm not. A, yeah, no. You know what? You know what, John? I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb. I'm gonna risk my my my. my I don't care if we even lose viewers. I'm anti extinction. You know, you think that that's not a controversial thing to say, but it's super controversial too. I know. <laughs> like it's upsettingly controversial. Yeah. How controversial? It's so upsetting to me how controversial that statement is in fact i think we should do things to prevent to possibly that possibly from... prevent extinction yeah, yeah 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 that might be a good idea yeah um i should also note that the magazine that they have like based on what i can see from this crappy uh compressed png yeah that's in the 90s model the pterosaur that has the reptilian skin uh-huh that's super outdated yeah um meaning that coincidentally the ropen which matches the 90 model like three major known fossils that would have appeared in that magazine that they're showing them the the ropen uh may or may not be a composite of things from that magazine the magazine (laughs) we can see in an image on john whitcomb's site oh (laughs) Uh, which i should probably save just in case Mm -hmm. and post that into the google doc so it's saved forever, and there's no way that that can be erased from the internet. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, let's get into actual pterosaurs for a second. Yeah. I opened the Wikipedia page on pterosaurs, or uh, in the 90s might be equivalent to finding the Encyclopedia Britannica page for pterosaurs. So pterosaurs have a lot of great information about them because we've researched them, and there's people who are dedicated to the investigation of pterosaurs. They're called paleontologists. What? They're awesome. Uh, In the modern model, pterosaurs are described as being covered in hair-like filaments known as pechinofibers. Okay. They're basically, so they're similar, but not homologous to mammalian hair, meaning they don't have a common origin. Yeah. As a result... Pterosaurs are actually hypothesized to be endotherms, meaning oh, warm-blooded, gotcha. because they yeah. have the, the little bits of fur, which yeah. is a distinction from dinosaurs. Oh, okay. 
Pterosaur is the size of the Ropen, which would include uh, Quetzalcoatl, uh-huh. Quetzalcoatlus, and Pterodon. Uh-huh. They were generally adapted for long flights, like modern albatrosses. Yeah. As a result, and now you might know a thing or two about this, Brandon, mm-hmm. uh, through evolutionary natural selection, they were selected for low weights and minimal drag. Yeah. Which makes sense for flight. The Ropen, with a 21-foot-long tail... <laughs> he's not. He's super not, because that tail is a lot of drag. Yeah. Generally speaking, if a flying creature has a tail, they're small, and the tail is so they can perform very quick turns. Yeah, well, like, the tail... So you won't find tails similar as to the that described on the Ropen on... I don't think any flying creature, really... Yeah. Um, with, with, like minor exceptions, but those are more gliders than flyers. Well, um, the the younger, like older, there are older pterosaurs that did have the tail. Yeah, but they were extremely <laughs> tiny. Yeah, they were small creatures, which yeah. is which makes sense because a small creature might favor the ability to have a tail for agility and balance over a large long yeah. distance flyer. Because. The, the long distance flyers tend to have tails that serve more function than those of well you know you know what I'm talking about like they've got the big old fanny tail they've got a big yeah. old fan like tail not the pterosaur's big old dragon swinging tail that's gonna Basi- do you no good basically it's a question of basic thermo uh, not thermodynamics uh, aerodynamics <laughs> yeah man it's like thermodynamics get that shit out of here aerodynamics it's, is where it's at man yeah it's a question of basic aerodynamics however Jonathan Whitcomb reports it as being a scavenger. It is that is not a trait attributed to long distance flyers. No for obvious reasons. Uh and on that point, if it was a scavenger, the Ropen would unlikely be uh what is it? Twenty by twenty feet? Yeah, it'd be smaller. It'd it would be, be much boy. smaller. It'd be a tiny be boy. A, it would be a much smaller creature. And yeah. generally speaking, um, scavengers are predators as well. Like, there's a few scavengers that are explicitly uh, scavengers, mm-hmm. but, like, leopards will turn to scavenger if predation fails. Yeah. Right? Um, so, on a uh, nutritional basis alone, it doesn't make sense for it to be this size. Because for it to have a breeding population and not be detected in a real meaningful way, it's ludicrous. Sasquatch yeah. makes more sense for existing than a breeding population of pterosaurs. Yeah. Especially ones that are this size. Yeah. Not only that, there is actually a pterosaur that is a scavenger. No shit. Okay, what are we talking about here? So scroll down a little bit in the document. Yep. It's called uh, Aram Borgonia Philadelphia. Okay. Um, the Ropen's limb structure is completely maladaptive to terrestrial locomotion. Yeah. Um, an actual scavenger, while this, this fossil was found before the Ropen existed, uh-huh. we didn't know about its scavenging traits until after the Ropen was uh, popularly reported on. Gotcha. And then finally, as I stated before, bioluminescence uh-huh. does not happen in terrestrial vertebrate. <laughs> it's not a trait that has occurred in our anything. And while technically, yes, there are no existing um, relatives to the pterosaur, there is nothing to assume that they were bioluminescent. It's just, it doesn't make sense. Occam's razor says they were not bioluminescent. Yeah. Yeah. If we find evidence that they were, sure. But Occam mm. Razor says no. So, to me, this means that the Ropen is a weird hodgepodge chimera created by someone with no understanding of science, uh, no understanding of pterosaurs, and is out to do something with an agenda, which in this case is deny evolution. Yeah, no, that's a big one. He he's making up things to fit into a, a you know a model that he's trying to make himself to exactly. disprove other things. Yeah, it's at its core, it's the opposite of science. Yeah, you're starting with a conclusion and working to make 
something that's not. Yeah. So why it's garbage? If you don't think it's garbage <laughs> at this point, I don't know if I'm going to be able it to convince you. It seems pretty this legit. Life. I mean, I don't know. I it's it's. I think it might be a real thing. The roping. Yeah. So you might notice that I have not been reporting on sightings. Yeah, that's weird. I mean, why are you keeping? Why are you holding back all the sightings, John? Why it's, don't keep the secret just for yourself? Tell me, tell me about the sightings. Where are there the sightings, are John? Other, there are other sightings. Oh, are there sightings? Okay. However, yeah. All of them were reported after Jonathan Whitcomb talked about it. That's not weird at all. And most of them are easily explained as, pl- as plane lights. <laughs> um, <laughs> most accounts of the rope in and indigenous stories occur yeah. after Western interaction. Okay. Um, there's a picture of a statue on the uh, cryptid wiki yeah. of a pterosaur looking man. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> that's not that's not a pterosaur. <laughs> That's a naked man with an eagle's head on. Yeah. Uh, that Trey the Explainer guy actually found a listing for that particular fetish statue. Yeah. Uh, and it's basically an ant- ancestor worship thing. And not only that, but that statue is from 19- the 1950s. <laughs> yeah. Um, more importantly, and because he's the main proponent of it, uh, Jonathan Whitcomb is incredibly untrustworthy. Yeah. Um, he actually has multiple pseudonyms uh, that are on the internet in favor of the Ropen theory. Really? Ropen hypothesis. Ropen hypothesis would be uh-huh. a better way of putting it. Um, which to me is sock puppeting. puppeting. Yeah. Like, he literally said that it was an honest thing to have a pen name, which in some yeah. cases it is. But in this case, it's not. So he has two main pseudonyms. So if you're looking up the rope in, know that these are both Jonathan Whitcomb, Norman Huntington, and Nathaniel Cole. Those are both him. And he admitted <laughs> to that. Um, and I'm going to read a direct quote from one of his blogs. If you had Googled something like Live Pterosaur in 2005, the first page may have included a site that included the words stupid, dinosaur, and lies in the URL. Yes, it was libel, and the site probably would still be out. It probably, and that site probably is still out there. But try searching live pterosaur today. You won't see that li- libelous site listed on the first three pages of Google. You will find that most of the pages are positive in the, about the possibility of modern living pterosaurs. The few that are negative are not the least, are at least not libelous. My purpose in using the pen name Norman Huntington differed from that of Alice Sheldon, but was equally valid. I got around potential bias in readers by using the name instead of my own. The difference is this. I was trying to attract attention to the basic idea of modern pterosaurs, not to my own writing ability. In fact, I altered my writing style for the blog post using... (laughs) He's not a good enough writer that I care that he changed his writing style because he's a terrible writer. I've read his stuff. It's nearly incomprehensible. Um... Before that, as I said before, he argued that the use of a pen name can be perfectly honest, which is true. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, but he's not fucking Dr. Seuss. Yeah. He's using it to hide his identity to game SEO and create I was just going to say he's trying to game the SEO, man. He is. Yeah. He's trying to create a fake movement yeah. with no actual evidence because – he thinks the world is only 6,000 years old, and he's trying to use pterosaurs to prove that it's not. Yeah. Which is dumb, as I said before. Even if a pterosaur still exists today, the roping that he's describing does not match any fossil <laughs> evidence of a pterosaur. <laughs> if anything, if the roping existed, it would be proof of evolution, because it's evolutionary dis- evolutionarily distinct from the predecessors that are found in the fossil record. He's an idiot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at least he's spending his own dumb money to, to fly around. But that's, the, but, but that's not the problem. All, almost all the witnesses that are reported come from him. One of them yeah. was a guy in the military who was stationed in New Guinea sometime around 1944. Yeah. Um, 
the problem isn't that he's spending his own money. The mm-hmm. problem is he's pushing bad non-science as science. Yeah. That's a problem. He's trying to feed everybody the shot glass of bullshit, man. That's a major problem. And yeah. I am very mad about this because it's not just about creationism. This is about science denial in general. This is yeah. a critical problem that faces the world today. The reason we have an extinction event happening is because of science denial. The reason our temperatures have been getting more and more wild is because of science denial. Measles, mumps, rubella, they're all making a comeback because of people like this. Yeah. I hate this That that lady should, I think, you know, I also think the, um, was it Jenny, Jenna McCarthy that did it? Yeah. I I think she should probably, like, she, uh. They're not criminals by any modern law. I think but, she should be held, held as, like she should be held liable for you know <laughs> she th- that should be criminal. <laughs> the, uh, he's not well. The thing is, he's not pulling the trigger, but he is building the gun. Yeah. Well, he and he's not gun, doing. He, I, I was talking about Je- uh, Jenny McCarthy. <laughs> well, no, the same thing. <laughs> the the anti vax stuff. Yeah, n- yeah, they're not pulling the trigger. They're just showing people the gun and saying, "Hey, here, look at this." And then people proceed to shoot themselves in the head and shoot the, the head of people who are unable to fight for themselves, fend for themselves, do defend themselves. People like this make me sick. And not only that, he has reduced Evelyn Cheeseman to a footnote in his oh, disgusting game. Oh, yeah. That's the reason I led the episode talking about her. Yeah. Because you know yeah, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her story is more than just seeing the rope and lights. Yeah. She is an extremely accomplished scientist, and she's contributed more in her life than this man ever will. This man has might might have even done more damage than... The, the damage he has done to discourse is disgusting. Yeah. I This is the first time you've ever heard me legitimately mad on this podcast, listeners. And this is me <laughs> legitimately mad. Generally speaking, I don't care about believing in cryptids. I, to me, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you believe in the Dover Demon. I don't care if you believe in Sasquatch. I literally don't. I do care if you believe in the Ropin. Because the Ropin is clearly false. It's clearly an agenda. And it's performed by someone who has no regard or care for individuals of indigenous uh, persuasions. Um... They don't care about facts. They don't care about science. They have a stated agenda. And here's the really, the most damning bit of evidence, in my opinion. If the Ropen existed, why did Evelyn Cheeseman not say anything about it? She's talked about the lights, yes. But she was known as the Lady of the Mountains to the indigenous people of Papua Yeah. Mountain. The woman who walks. Yes. Why would they not tell her about a literal giant flying demon which steals corpses from graves? How could she have traveled in that region for 12 years without ever having seen it? It's not like she was just visiting for a week on a missions trip or something like that. She was traveling. She was looking for type specimens of new and exotic creatures. She was adding to the overall scientific, scientific knowledge of the world. How does she not know about it? And not only that, I know she didn't say anything about it because if she did, it would have been on that blog post where I found the the, the quote from the book. Yeah. And you know what? I don't have anything else to say on this topic, <laughs> but if you believe in the Ropen, really take a deep, long look at the evidence. It's extremely clear to me because there's no evidence of it. There's not even... The fakest of fake uh, corpses has been found. Which, something that's 20 by 20 feet. Yeah. yeah. The world's a big place, and we there's stuff that's lost in the ocean. But there's not that much land mass. And most of it has people living on it. So this is a comedy <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Happy 2019, folks! Yeah. Happy 2019. (laughs) Hopefully next episode won't get me as mad. (laughs) 
but man, I'm so sorry that I, I, there was a warning at the top that I was going to get mad. Yeah. <laughs> I will say I didn't. This is also one of our longest episodes too. It's up there. Yeah. On the list of longest episodes, but I'm sorry for getting angry. I love you listeners. Don't apologize. Let the darkness consume you. Oh, I'm letting it. It feels good. It feels good to get just mad at Jonathan Whitfield. Feels good. You know a what? little sticky. A little. Um, you know what? Here's the thing. I'll say it. If Jonathan Whitcomb wants to talk to me, <laughs> we can talk. Yeah. We can talk. But you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna <coughs> find a paleontologist. Yeah. Who specializes in pterosaurs, and they're going to be on this, this, this podcast with me if I can. Because you know what? I do believe that people have the right to defend themselves, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the person who attacks me. I'm going to have someone who knows the facts, because you know what? I had to do a crap ton of research on pterosaurs to basically be able to say, this is why this is wrong. But you know what? <laughs> I'll make it a bonus episode. If someone get, if someone gets him on a podcast with me, I'll make that a bonus episode. And if they could find a paleontologist because I'm lazy. I'll find a paleontologist. I'll go. <laughs> you know what I'll do? Oh, we'll go, we'll, go to, we'll go to the city. We'll go to the city. We'll go to the Museum of Natural History. We'll talk to someone there. And we'll try and convince them to get on a podcast with us. And that's what I want to do. Because... This is ludicrous. It's ludicrous that he has manipulated SEO to the point that it makes it seem like there's an actual community built up around this creature. Ludicrous. Ludicrous. I yeah. Well, it's bad enough where, where it's where – it's, his whole deal is bad enough to the point where it's almost like, is it – is it worth arguing with him because that could potentially legitimize his point by saying, well, if an expert's willing to, to... – That's true. That's true. Yeah. I will give you that. I. That's why it would not be on the uh, the main feed. Gotcha. Yeah, it yeah. Would not, I would not release that publicly. It would be released on the Patreon feed because it's not to give him – it's deliberately not giving him a platform. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Technically, it is giving him a platform, but it wouldn't be like a publicly exposed platform. It would be couched behind something else because I have no interest in releasing that as a public platform. Yeah. So, but I am not a fan of this man. I think he, I don't care what he is in, in his normal life. <laughs> he might be fine to his family, but I don't care because he's doing irreparable harm to science. Yeah. And that is a sin. I like That's... your comments on the sources too, by the way. You, oh. you put little comments next to each source. <laughs> There's oh. one says, I hate this man. One uh, says, Terrible documentary. One says, Video of a frigate bird. <laughs> one oh, yeah, the... says all the people talking about the rope in are him. <laughs> yeah, that's that's actually um the thing where I started texting you a lot. Yeah. That was when I found source number seventeen. Oh. I found it by I, I Googled um I Googled rope and debunk because I was like, well, maybe I'm missing something, you know, and I just want to look at one more person who has a debunk on it to see if I'm missing yeah. any like things that he said. And then I found the thing that I read to you. Yeah. It was quoted on that website that I found. Uh -huh. And I was just like, oh, so it's definitely fake. Yeah. Like, it's not <laughs> even a question of <laughs> anywho. I... I'm just glad to have that out of my system. Yeah. Any, the long and short of it is uh, Evelyn Cheeseman is a great woman. She should be remembered by history. And at the very least, she is kind of remembered by history because she was, you know, uh, canonized in the, the Dictionary of British Botanists and uh, Entomologists. Yeah. So great person. She worked hard. She was a hard worker. Um, ultimately extremely impressive. She's one of my heroes now as a result of this. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Um, <sighs> man, it's like, it's like I just exercised the demon from my body. That has been eating me up. Now the diarrhea um, can stop. Now the diarrhea can stop. Um, 
So <laughs> let's let's I guess let's read the the plugs. Uh, <laughs> as always, um, if you want to get in contact with us, we have a lot of contact information on CryptopediaCast.com. Um, our Instagram and Twitter are at CryptopediaCast. You can email us CryptopediaCast at gmail.com or us at CryptopediaCast. Um, we have a Patreon. We have a few subscribers now. Well, two. At yeah, the time man. Recording. We um, have Clay Sinclair is the yeah. one that they, and then the other one uh, is $2 a month. So you get the, uh, you, you get to look at the copies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we have keep some in mind, great, huh? I uh, say we have some great uh, sponsors only or jackalope only uh, content coming yep. out. Uh, we've got you know the uh, little mini podcasts. We've got yep. we read um, monster adjacent pasta. And monster have, adjacent pasta. We have uh, my fantastic uh, relationship advice column, which I would say I'm overqualified for. You definitely are. You're the most overqualified person for the nation's podcast. Um, it, I love it. It's my favorite podcast right now. It's sure. fun. I do it out of procrastination because I could try to slog through resources and, uh, you know, write stuff. Or I could do that. <laughs> Honestly, the number of things that I do that are just procrastination on doing things that I should be doing, it's a lot. <laughs> a lot. Um, yeah, we also have a Facebook group, which has been getting. We got a new member. Woo! I don't know if we got any new ones because, as always, we record these like two weeks in advance. So you know, yeah, <laughs> things could change. Uh, um, if you like the show, if you're not put off by my angry rant, which I promise you is only because of the subject matter. So hopefully, I don't cover uh, Moko Memble anytime soon. Oh, Makili um, Membe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That one's that one might actually be worse than this. <laughs> one. But we're not going to cover that right now. I'm going to have to probably take at least a year before we touch that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, rate, review, subscribe. Uh, like last episode, we recorded about the same time. Still about the same number of subscribers, but you know we're growing every week. Thank you. Uh, word of mouth is great. Um, we have stickers. So if you actually subscribe to the Patreon, we may send a few stickers out to a few select people um, for free, which is not technically free because you're paying for them. But hey, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, commercial ideas. If you got them, send them. Yeah, man. Times be tough. So you got any plugs, Brandon? No. No? Okay, no. well. No, 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 no. You could follow me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at crypto brandon, capital C, capital B. And I'm at mu2057 on Instagram. Probably Transformers pictures or cat pictures. It's usually what it is. Sorry. <laughs> um... My Twitter is at JF Dunham, usually me ranting about something that I'm currently researching. There's a pretty great chain of me being very angry about this episode. <laughs> uh, there is. And if you want to email me, uh, john at cryptopediacast.com or DM me on any of those services. And our art is done by Tom Hill. You could follow him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. As always, uh, I'm John the Angry Man Dunham. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe a little angry. How long was the tale? When you got to Lake Pong, did you see something unusual or strange, something you saw? Could she tell how high it was? Uh... Describe what Marcellus Wallace looks like!